Yeah, right. The big point here, of course, is that parenting is shaped by our society or our culture or what we are taught to do, and it can be quite different from place to place. And so one might think that biologically we respond to infants all in the same way. And there is something about when you once you get attuned to the the cry of a child, it's actually very difficult to train someone to ignore a child crying. And sometimes when we're trying to get people to come out of hostage situations, we, or to get them to come out, we blast child cries really loud because it's a super, super difficult thing to hear. But you can be trained to do this and your parenting is shaped by your society. And so there's all kinds of different examples of people. And when those, those mother, the goosey mothers are, were shown videos of how American or US women were doing their parenting and doing that letting it cry, let them cry it out kind of thing. Uh, Levine says the mothers were appalled they concluded they were clearly incompetent mothers, that they were doing it wrong, that they were bad. Now, when someone looks at another society and says, aha, they're wrong, they're being incompetent, this is not even a, what is that called when we look at another society or we think, yeah. Ethnocentrism. So the, the Guzzi are actually giving us an example of ethnocentrism here. They believe that their way is the right way to do things and that the other ways are bad or incompetent. Or... Now they could be correct, that's possible. But, uh, so ethnocentrism is a concept that uh, Muckle Gonzalez and Camp bring up on page 200. I've, we've talked about it, We I raised it earlier uh, in the class. Um, because it's 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 an important concept. We all have to be, perhaps just to survive, we have to be somewhat ethnocentric. You can't be questioning yourself every time you do something that is culturally influenced, but it becomes a problem if you let that ethnocentrism spill over into uh, thinking that someone is is bad or less than human or something like that. There's another good example that I I, I really like here uh, by Harkness and Super about the Dutch parenting and their three R's, um, which um, was two, three, the, well, the, the rest, regularity, and cleanliness, but in, uh, in that language, those, those all have to start with R, so they get to have three R's for those. And one of the things I like about this is, although the Dutch may seem really far away, uh, it's not quite as distant, and we can kind of see it in, uh, in, in so-called Western or European societies, as well as people who are, who are, are more seen as more culturally distant. And the other thing that's really interesting about the Dutch example is it seems to translate biologically into their children sleeping more than American infants, which is uh, something that I tried. I tried the three R's and you know, I tried as hard as possible to get them to sleep more. But it, it's partially based on what you can do in your society. And so they go on to say that the Dutch society, the way it's structured, you can do these things because you can walk to get uh, to get your groceries and and the whole society is structured around these kinds of uh, these kinds of principles. So we talked about that in the last class, how what we what we think about the world influences how we try to structure it and make it and and is reflected or reinforced in our material culture. So, what this is, I think one of the main points of this article is against having an ethnocentric attitude towards something that people get really worked up about, which is childcare and how you raise your children. This is one of the areas that people will all sometimes scream at each other about on the street still, uh, you know, if you're doing something wrong um, or perceived to be wrong. And so against that sort of ethnocentric attitude and toward a more 
what we call cultural relativism. Now, I want to pause here for a second and say that cultural relativism is how we try to understand other people and understand what they're doing from within its own context. It doesn't necessarily mean we approve of everything people are doing. It just says that we're trying to use it as a tool for understanding uh, what, how, why people are making the decisions they're doing. We want to be very careful as we've learned, culture is learned, it's learned patterns of behavior. And so when we approach the learned patterns of behavior of others, we want to be careful not to prematurely judge them. But again, that doesn't mean we want to accept everything that, that other people do. The goosey could be right. We could be incompetent parents here. So there's a number of different, uh, different examples here of people trying to go beyond ethnocentric approaches to child care. Uh, what some people call ethnopediatrics, which is trying to take cultural cultural values and cultural ideas into account as we as as we we um, raise our children. And so there's some major issues that parents face. Zariana has told us there's the idea of when you should pay attention and be hands on and hold the infants and pay attention to them crying versus the idea that they should be on a schedule of holding. And if they're not, then they should have to cry it out and deal with it themselves, uh, which is something that uh, Ronald Barr talks about uh, in the small article on page four. There's the whole issue of feeding. And when, uh, when, uh, Infants should be weaned and put onto solid foods, how long they should breastfeed. This is one of the things that people in our society get very concerned about whenever breasts and infants are, are, are shown. Detweiler here makes an argument that, that we should be waiting probably much longer than any of us would want to wait to wean. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an important point uh, that she's making that we've really, in most cases, condensed this uh, more than what seems to be the norm among other non-human primates. And then, of course, sleep and how much sleep you get. McKenna here makes uh, the case for, uh, for, for co-sleeping, which the many, I think the official pediatric story is that you should, you should not be doing this. You should have your your baby's in a crib lying up to sleep or else they might uh, experience uh, sudden infant death syndrome. But McKenna claims that it's the other way around. That infants especially learn how to breathe and regulate their hearts uh, by sleeping next to the parent. So if this is done properly, if this is done well, it should actually prevent uh, sudden infant death syndrome. So, um, you know, I would not, I, I would say if you're in terms of parenting and advice, look into all of these things. Um, a lot of, a lot more people do end up uh, co-sleeping and doing various different things in our society than perhaps this idea that in other societies, they do one thing and we do one thing in our society. There's actually quite a lot of variation within our own society. Um, and it is kind of strange how the infant has, has this sort of strange breathing, not even a pattern at first, but if you put the infant close to you, it kind of can coordinate its breathing and its heartbeat with your own. It's, uh, yeah, that's kind of a special thing. So maybe don't sleep with it, but you know, you can do that a lot. Um, and of course, as we, talked about at the beginning, one of the main points here is that child, the way we rear our children uh, expresses or inculcates values. And Ariana has given us that model from uh, going to Gonzales and Michael Gonzales and camp of dependence training and independence training. Um, and so we believe that by doing these things that we do, the scheduling, the cry it out, the weaning early, 
and making them sleep in their own beds that we're creating uh, independence and among our children and that's a, a way that we raise them. So this was, uh, whoa, what just happened? I don't even know. Aha, dependence training is when you have, um, or say, uh, a set of child rearing practices supports the family unit over the individual. So in societies with dependence training, and then there's independence training, well, Gonzalez and Camp say that we have the set of child rearing practices that foster a child's sense of individuality. Um, when I reviewed, they they used these terms in the last edition of the textbook, and I told them I didn't. I told them to throw them out. I didn't like them at all because I think that these terms are are, are value laden. Who, who wants to say that I'm practicing dependence training? I'm making a dependent person. And I told them, this is the one sentence that I think they did change. And I said, this, it doesn't make our kids any ind more independent. Like, look at how dependent they are. They're with us much more than in so-called traditional societies. We take care of them for so long. And in fact, they said that here. Where see, these methods of child rearing do not necessarily produce more independent children, as the name may suggest. Darn right they don't. They're so dependent. So I, I was kind of, uh, I'm, I've never been fond of these terms, and I, I'm not particularly convinced that different societies have or don't have these. I think uh, one of one person who isn't here talked about this as a continuum. That there's a kind of continuum, which I can. I think that's a good. I think that's a good way to think about this as as a kind of continuum of values which are probably present in every society, um, but in our textbook, it's it's more as if each society has one. My own terms for this would be that dependence training is are people that say, "All right, <laughs> you need to." pay attention to your social environment first, because that's what you do depend on is your family and the people around you. And, and that is the, those that you should prioritize. And there are societies that certainly emphasize to their children that, you know, you share or else, you know, you have to be, you have to be part of, of this social unit or else you're going to be in trouble. Whereas, uh, you know, I think that there are people in our society who don't teach a child to be social and teach a child to basically look after you, you know, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And so, you know, I'm not sure that makes you independent from society. In fact, it doesn't, but it does inculcate the idea that somehow you have absolute freedom to Pursue whatever you want to do. I'm going to do what I want to do. So, I mean, I think this this is a it's a, it's an interesting it's an interesting framework and idea. As long as you look at it, perhaps more as a continuum, realize that these tendencies exist in every society, and uh, and I would again maybe my term social first and me first are also value laden because I'm obviously. Uh, not liking the independence training, but I think that calling something dependence training is a bit, it's a bit value laden as well. All right. So anyway, good stuff. So the other thing I really like about uh, Small's article is how it tells us about how culture gets under our skin and becomes biological so that it feels so natural to us and it comes to us through this the as before we even know it as we're being raised and so some people have called have said that that we are biocultural creatures we have to have culture in order to make our biology work correctly and uh this is what uh uh Alex in the last class was talking about that holism or being integrated uh, as an element of culture. So one of the, like I said, one of the reasons I like this is because Small points out on page four 
that when the human in infant is born, partly because of, of our bipedalism and the way the hips have to be designed in order to have big brained infants and still be able to walk upright, when the infant's brain comes out, it still has a lot of development to do. It still has a lot of growth to do. In fact, much of the growth that happens in an infant's brain happens outside of the womb. And so you have these very dependent creatures that come out. They're not able to walk. They're not able to talk. They can't feed themselves. They're kind of a mess. They're not, they're even their breathing and their heart rates become coordinated to whoever is picking them up and carrying them around and dancing with them and singing to them. And so we have all of this brain neurons and things going on in our heads, our brains and bodies are developing at a time that we are being carried around or put on in cribs or put in car during a very uh, important time of intense nurture, when we're being told who we belong to and who our relatives are and who you should call and how you should, how you should do things. And so what this means is that this whole idea that there's a dichotomy, a dividing between nature and nurture or uh, nature and the environment, uh, anthropology, Anthropology would question that divide because this is all happening at once. Some people have called it the natural nurtural or the you tried to make new words for it because it's it's one continuous process. There's not you can't say, aha, we found what's human nature. And and we can separate that or strip it away from the culture or society. And so there as we talked about with Augustine Fuentes on human nature, you can't really define a human nature apart from the histories and the, the nurture elements that, uh, that are encountered. So what we see is that it's, there, just like we saw with the paleo diet, there's not one way there's not, it's not like the hunter-gatherers figured out how to raise kids and we should all be doing that. There's not one natural way to raise kids. There's all kinds of different ways that people have developed in diverse historical cultural circumstances and environments, bringing back a word from our biological anthropology unit and our archaeological unit that are niche constructed, that have changed the conditions of selection so that we grow up either lying in cribs or sitting in chairs or being held or being on our mother's backs. Uh, these are things that influence the way we our biology brain develops and behaves and makes it seem that our culture, the things we learn is completely natural to us or that it feels like it's the only way, the only way you should do things. And when you're confronted with a different way, it feels like, oh, how can that be? Clearly incompetent mothering going on over there uh, when someone is doing something uh, different from what you're doing. So I like this article, uh, like I said, uh, both for its illustration of, of what we mean by ethnocentrism, cultural relativism, and how culture gets under our our skin.